The Human Rights Writers Association of Nigeria has alleged that sponsors of violence are increasingly sabotaging the security of the Southeast region. In a statement issued by its national coordinator, Emmanuel Omubiko, the group said President Muhammad Buhari should be told that his failure to explore a political solution to release the detained leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Ipob Namdi Kanu, is an invitation to anarchy and violence in the region. Now, the group also urged that the Southeast people uh, in the federal government at the state level were responsible for President Buhari's failure to honor his promise after meeting with the Igbo elites during which he pledged to consider their plea to release Nkanu. Now, joining us to discuss this is Emmanuel Omubiko. He is the National Coordinator of the Human Rights Writers Association of Nigeria. Mr. Omubiko, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. So I'm happening. curious to understand why um, you presume that the insecurity in the Southeast, um, you know, is somewhat being fueled by um, elites. I mean, many people have attributed it to so many things. So many people have said it's, you know, IPOP, some have said it's unknown gunmen. Some have even said that there are outsiders who were paid to come into the, uh, you know, the region to cause mayhem. But, but where did, you know, the Human Rights Rights Association come up with this idea from? Well, the issue of insecurity in the South is the factors responsible are multifaceted. Uh, you cannot uh, perfectly say this exactly is the cause of the problem or these are the characters that are unleashing this uh, you know, violence in the Southeast. But you can take a little bit of time and analyze news contents and statements that have been made over the past uh, couple of months and years by certain uh, elements in the society. I think that statement, I may be the people who actually treated the statement issue yesterday I don't think they took their time to really uh, interpret the statement the way we wanted it to be. We didn't actually blame the elites for creating the insecurity in the Southeast. We blame members, what we call members of the deep state, certain individuals who do not want the region to be stable, who do not want security in the Southeast, maybe for their own pecuniary reasons. Some of these people may not even actually be from the Southeast uh, region. Some are actually embedded in the armed security forces because we have come to know that one of the causes of the, um, the reason why we seem to have insecurity all around the country and the reason why they are escalating is because certain persons in government and out of government are benefiting immensely. They're, they're, these people are the people who call uh, conflict entrepreneurs. They make a lot of cash, a lot of capital out of conflict. So these are the individuals that are actually, uh, you know, you know, stoking up the violence in the Southeast, particularly. And um, what we what we said is that it is the duty of the political elites from the Southeast region because there are quite a number of uh, people in government from that region of the country, they have not really done sufficient, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, they have not really shown suffi sufficient commitments but, to but, really... But, but, but to, to, let me, I mean, I'm not holding brief for the governments in the Southeast, but let me just, because they're not here to defend themselves. In Imo State, recently, there was a summit or a security meeting um, which had several governors from the Southeast in that meeting, including the Imo State gov governor, and, of course, the idea of that meeting was to deal with the situation within the states. Now, I'm, I'm saying this because uh, you're talking about the body language and the responses. Imo State also seems to be a hotbed. And Anambra, at, um, I think, on Nisha area, we see a lot of these things happening. But can we put this at the feet of those people that you call the deep states, those who you think are benefa uh, benefactors, uh, beneficiaries, I beg your pardon, of this um, you know, violence and that, that's happening in the southeast? What about the people themselves that live in these areas? Community policing is supposed to be a thing. It's supposed to be a way of life. We need to also have all hands on deck, shouldn't we, um, to deal with this issue. So can we only leave this at the doorsteps of the federal government and all the other people you pointed fingers at? 
Well, one thing you will have to know is that the Constitution is quite clear on who has command and control of the security forces in Nigeria. The Constitution itself is not a very perfect document. There, there, there has to be some kind of reworking of the Constitution to allow the uh, federating units to have some kind of control over the security of their immediate environment. Because in the Constitution, the governors are actually said to be the chief security officers of their state. But in actuality, the president is the man who pulls the, the strings. He's the one that tells the police what they're going to do. He's the one that also commands the armed forces, even though the National Assembly uh, has some kind of roles to play, secondary role to play in terms of deployment of uh, the armed, armed security forces. But the president is the person in charge of security of this country. Nobody should shift any blame to wherever. But the reason why people are speaking about the governors not doing quite enough to put the insecurity in their various states to a check is that every state governor has very juicy allocations they give to themselves, they carve out, and they pocket this huge amount of money that they uh, come to be for security, they call it security votes. Okay. So individual citizens of this country should ask the governor's question, if you have a large chunk of the budget or even uh, the large chunk of cash that are not even actually budgeted by the state assembly, that then you, you control this uh, huge, humongous amount of money, you call it security votes. What are you actually doing with the security votes of your state government? Why is it that, for instance, in Imo State, why is it so much a problem for the governor to actually settle down in a way. Oops, he's, not, he's, he's frequently in Abuja, always in Abuja. He seems to be operating the government of Imo State from Abuja. If you see that in a way... That, 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 that to me sounds Abuja. like an Imo problem. That doesn't sound like a Southeast problem. That sounds to me like an Imo State governor problem and not necessarily the problem of the Southeast. I'm going to ask exactly. again, what are the it people is. in the Southeast... And I'm not just talking about the people who reside in the Southeast. I'm talking about the people who represent the Southeast at all levels, whether they be in the corporate world, whether they be in the political world, the people who are the kinsmen, the ones, the stakeholders, what are they doing to deal with this issue? Are all hands on deck? Again, the Igbos are angling for presidency. They are agitating to be given an opportunity to you know, take their shot at this presidency. But when, the, when everybody turns around and looks at the Southeast, I mean, what's coming from there? It, it doesn't really make, it's not palatable. So why would anybody want to be giving anybody, anything to, I'm, I'm not in any way saying the Southeast should not run, but I'm saying, does this paint a good picture of the people in the Southeast? It, it even amounts to a fallacy to argue in that format because when uh, Muhammad Buhari became the president, what was happening in the north? The entire northern region was almost in a state of war. And as we speak, the entire north, northwest, the Kasana state, where the president comes from, he cannot, if, if you remove the soldiers, if you remove the DSS, if you remove the police that secure uh, the president, he cannot go to Kasana state and drive on the streets of Kasana because, let me tell you, the other time, two, uh, some few days ago, a almost 75 or 77 year old man had to sell his roof, he dismantled his, the roof of his house you know, in order to raise 100,000 naira that he has to pay to campus who took his only son away and were demanding for 100,000 naira in Kasana. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you that the instability they have in the North did not stop the North from producing the president of Nigeria. If you're viewing it that way, then the North should never, ever, ever rule Nigeria. So that is not even an issue. And the insecurity you have in the Southeast basically as we said, insecurity is being instigated by elements embedded in the federal government. Because let me tell you, people are saying you picked up uh, somebody, Nam uh, he, he went to Kenya, the circumstances of his arrest, nobody, nobody has told anybody how he was actually uh, apprehended, who did the apprehension. The Kenya government is saying, we don't know anything about the arrest of Nam Dekano. The government is saying, we, we caught him in Kenya. How did you catch him? How did you bring him back? And there are a lot of allegations about uh, renditions, illegal abductions, and the rest of them. And 
People are suggesting political solutions to the problems. Whether you like it or not, the agitation that some of these young boys and young girls in that part of the country have been, uh, you know, uh, you know, doing is because of the marginalization, because of this kind of attitude of a lot of Nigerians. Say, why do we have to allow the Igbos to be uh, to become president of Nigeria? Why shouldn't the Igbo become the president of Nigeria? Look, let me tell you, if not for mathematical crime that they commit at the federal level, if the census figures are to be, uh, you know, compiled scientifically, the Igbos are about the largest population of this country that you have. There's no part of this country where you will not have people from the south I, of Nigeria I, residing. I, I, are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? I want to believe that you're, you're just trying to make a case here, that the Igbos might be the largest. Are you, are you serious? Statistically. Of course. Ebos, Ebos are the largest. Ebos are largest in terms of population because if you look at the demography of this country, if you look at the settlements, if you where you stay, that how many wives does Ibo. an Ibo man marry? How many wives does the average Ibo man marry? Well, how many nobody, children nobody does he have? have? There's no law that says you have no, to no, marry. No, 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 uh, no. We're, we're talking numbers here. So in, indulge me. How many wives does the average Ibo man marry compared to the man in the northeast, the northwest? You can marry as much as many wives as you No, 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 no. We're doing one. numbers. Let, let, let's do the numbers. Well, We're talking wife, about population wife. and doubling numbers here. So I just wanted to take you up on that, but you're not going to answer me. Finally, no, the, what do the you think? The population does not count for the number of wives you have. You may even have 10 wives. If none of them has a child, that does not count the population. You may have just one wife who will have 12 children. My mother. I just, gave, I just used that as... I just used that as you know, so an it, example. It, there are many it, more. I am telling you that you can have 10 wives, and those 10 wives do not have what, a single child, but you can have a wife who will have like 12 children. I feel my own mother had 12 children. She is the only wife of my late father. You understand? So the number of wives you have does not count in the number of children you have. This is this is the same kind of arguments the Northerners are doing, saying, uh, how many of them are I mean, actually even marrying four wives to start with? The president, how many wives does he have? The president had just one wife. Most not an elite don't have one and a wife. We'll, so have, to, we'll have to have another census to be able to clarify this statistic. But finally, going forward, because with these conversations, when we have them, we need to also find a solution. What is the solution to the problem in the Southeast as we speak now? Um, because I saw um, governors come together, but is there a unifying force that wants to really put an end to this? Whether it means fishing out those you say are in the federal government masterminding these or the sponsors of these evil attacks within the Southeast, what is the way forward? Well, the way forward, you have even answered the question. The way forward is that the elites from that part of the country, whether you are in government, whether you are out of government, like some of us who have never been in government for some time, those of us who are outside the government who represent the commoners, whether you are a member of the commoner, whether you are in the diaspora, it is your responsibility as an Igbo person, as somebody from that part of the region, to uh, contribute your uh, position regarding how to resolve this situation in the Southeast. And the basic, the basic uh, element that can bring about uh, stability and peace in that region is for the president to release Nambikano from detention. Because it is not an offense that somebody sit down somewhere in London and somebody begins to throw jibes at, at anybody. The governor of Katina State, uh, I mean, Edna Bikani didn't do uh, half of what the governor of Katina, the man who is governor of Katina State has done, the kind of abuses he has been abusing, different kinds of people abusing good Lord Jonathan, abusing whoever cares in the, in the south of Nigeria. Abusing we have Nibos. to go. The, the gumi of a man has abused virtually everybody, abused the army, abused everybody, and has been fraternizing with terrorists. Nobody has arrested him. So. Why do you have to carry out this kind of selective, you know, just uh, just you just arrest a man, you just kept the invitation and said because he, he was based in London and he was abusing Well, we have to go. We have to go. Uh, unfortunately, we have to go. I would love to have this conversation some other time, but um, we'll be cool. uh, we, we appreciate your thoughts and your comments. We're hoping that peace comes to the Southeast very soon. It will. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thank you, everybody, for staying with us. We hope you enjoyed the show. But before we go, we went to the streets to find out people's reactions to the former governor of Lagos' um, recent um, throwing his hat into the ring and declaring his intent to run for presidency. And that's all we have for you on Post Politics. I'm Mary Anakon. I'll see you tomorrow.
Eh, uh, it's majority that can carry the fort, not only me. Well, if you, if if Tinubu should run for the president, I don't think anything bad is needs, but there's going to be an issue, most especially legal state, which I know. The capital letter no. Capital letter no thing. No option for him to run, man. Still the same people, same old leaders, you know. It's still going to take us back, you understand? So we just want to move forward. There's a lot of youth that can rule the state and that can make things happen better. There are all, at least a lot of youth. Tunubu has ruled uh, Lagos State. I, I mean, I, I believe, my, in my own opinion, I, I believe he wants to go up there again, but he's, he's told us Tunubu is old already. Let the youth at least one of the youth should rule laws and let's see how the difference between the youth and the adult. Yes, I mean, Tinubu can run for presidency. He's from Nigeria, so he has every right to run. So the power depends on you. If you like, you can vote for him. If you like, 